to the Talent Optimization Podcast, the go-to podcast for CEOs and HR professionals wanting to bridge the gap between the strategy and tactical implementation of talent optimization within their organizations. Through interviews, predictive index, and personal experience, your host, Tracy Shirk, helps you discover the facets of talent optimization from both a CEO and HR perspective to truly create the dream team for your organization. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to Talent Optimization. We are chatting today about how do we optimize the talent in our organization at the very beginning, at the specific hire, right? And I don't know if you get excited about hiring, but hiring is one of those key things that organizations must do well. And what's really fun is that we know that 32% of hiring in that recruitment actually comes from HR generalists inside of the organization. We know that third-party recruiting and staffing firms only account for 10% of the responsible parties that are doing that hiring. What that tells us is that those in-house HR folks are very, very important in hiring for our organization. And we know that 18% of our hires are done very specifically by our hiring managers. So we're going to chat a little bit today about what is the best way to specifically hire in your organization? How do you prepare for that? What are some tips and tricks to ensure that you have a great hire if you're going to do that internally? So with that being said, planning is absolutely key to ensuring that we're bringing the best folks into our organization. And when we're planning on hiring that candidate, you know, we don't want to do the post and pray method where we're just going to post out to a job board and pray that the right person comes in to the organization. What we know about that is typically it's not. So, you know, there's a number of different ways to recruit individuals into an organization and into those key positions. You know, what we know is that internal mobility accounts for 40 to 60 percent of individuals moving into higher level positions. So that internal talent pathways is key for success inside of your organization. And how do you do that, right? How do you create those internal talent pathways? Intentionally. And when we have those internal talent pathways, what we're saying to our workforce is we believe that you have an opportunity to grow here, and it's also going to allow you to attract the best individuals to your organization that do want to grow. The second is specifically looking at employee referrals. So we know that employee referrals account for 20 to 40% of your hires. And, you know, when we attract individuals to us that like, know, and trust us, we're probably going to get a better hire. And one of the things that I see when I'm working with my clients and our clients here at Elevated Talent is so often we overlook this very specific item, which is that those specific hires that come directly from employee referrals. So if we look at our numbers, we know that the cost per hire on average is $4,425. We know that an executive cost per hire is $14,936. And that's according to the, the SHRM Talent Acquisition Benchmarking Report, right? So if we think about those dollar amounts and look at, hey, what are we paying out in employee referrals? Because so often I'm finding organizations are not really paying a lot of attention to employee referrals, even though these can account for up to 40% of our hires and we can get a better quality hire from our employee referrals. So I'm curious, what is your employee referral program inside your organization and how do you have that set up? Is that set up to pay out for a name? Is that set up specifically to pay out on day of hire? Or do you have some kind of benchmarks that, hey, you give us a name, we're going to give you a hundred bucks. You give us that person gets hired, we're going to give you another 500 bucks. That person makes it 30, 60, 90 days or a year. There's additional incentives involved with that. The reason why this is so important is that internal person that recommended the new hire in is going to be more likely to support them to be successful 
if they're also going to get something for that, right? Like the what's in it for me, like so many individuals that we're working with have the WIFM right across their forehead, right? The what's in it for me. So you want to make sure that we specifically play to that when we're looking at recruitment and hiring. All right, so we have a little bit left of hiring, right? And this is really where we're going to spend the majority of the time today. And that is specifically looking at this other percentage, which is the external recruiting, which is 10 to 20% of your hires. When we look at that external recruiting, we spend the majority of our time focused on external recruiting. And the reason why I give you these numbers up front is I want you to really pay attention to where are you spending the majority of your time and what percentage of the results are coming from that? Because maybe you need to shift a bit from external recruiting into employee referrals and really working with your staff to find out what would it take for them to refer individuals to your organization? Who do they know and how do we make that easy for them to do that? So let's now take a look at planning for hiring and that recruitment process. Here's the key. Do your managers know exactly what they're looking for in this new hire? And what we find so often when we're working with clients is that there is a disconnect between what the individual stakeholders think that they need in a new hire. So for example, you look at the immediate supervisor. What do they think they need in this new hire? We're going to look at the one level up. We call these skip level managers, and you're going to hear me talk about skip level managers here in a little bit as well. But with those skip level managers, they are going to oversee that area. In larger organizations, we like to bring in an executive over that area. And then, of course, a rock star in the role. And finally, human resources, because they're typically doing the blocking and tackling for those individuals to make sure that they get through that recruitment, hiring, onboarding process incredibly well. So with that being said, those five stakeholders many times have different perceptions of what that role looks like. And we want to make sure that that person is set up for success. You know, so often what I see when I'm talking with candidates or even myself, you know, stepping into roles inside of organizations, I got one manager saying, hey, I need X, Y, and Z in this way. Another saying, hey, I need X, Y, and Z in that way. And they're completely different. So I feel like I'm an octopus pulled in eight different directions. And if I don't feel like I can make an impact in that organization and be successful, I'm going to become very disengaged. So you want to take care of that problem at the very beginning of the recruitment process by calibrating the different stakeholders so we have one idea of what this specific job is and what are the outcomes? What are those performance expectations for the individual to be successful at two weeks, at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a year? So all of those key areas are going to tell us, yes, we know exactly what we need to do in order to be successful for that group. All right. So now that we've done a little bit of pre-work in, you know, when we're working with clients, we call this our, our job assessment. So we use a tool called predictive index that allows us to do a job assessment where we do a survey of each of those stakeholders for that position. Then we're also tying that into the job description, right? Because the job assessment is going to give us what are the behavioral traits needed for an individual to be successful in this position and making sure everybody's calibrated on that. And then we look at the job description to make sure we have the briefcase piece of it, which is essentially stating what are the skills, abilities, those types of things, experience that an individual needs to be successful, Because when we know exactly the head, what are the behavioral traits and the cognitive traits of an individual in this role, what's the culture of the organization, ensuring we're matching that with the individual, and then that briefcase piece, the the education experience, et cetera. So let me tell you a story. I had hired an individual into our organization, and I was so excited because he fit perfectly perfectly the cognitive and the behavioral aspects of the position that we had. You know, he was pretty okay from a cultural perspective. 
But where we had a huge miss was the experience. So, so often when we hire individuals, we're only hiring for the briefcase, the education, the experience. And here's the thing, we have to hire the whole person into a role. If we're not If we're not intentionally interviewing and hiring the whole person for the role, we're going to have a miss. And therefore, what I found the hard way is I had a huge miss because I was paying so much attention to the behavioral and the cognitive pieces and the culture. And I wasn't paying attention to the thing that I paid attention to for my entire career, right? And so, you know, I say that to say we want to make sure we pay attention to the whole person. So I want you to think for a second. The last hire you had, how are they doing? Where's the wins and where's the misses? What can you learn from that? Because those questions are really going to help you to know, hey, what do we need to do to tweak to move this person forward and these positions in our organization forward to make the best hires based on what's available in the market? So that's a little bit of our pre-planning for that hire. And I want to talk a bit about teamwork right? It takes a team to execute the business strategies inside of your organization. And it also takes a team to really hire the best person into each role because they're going to be working on a team. And so when you're hiring, you know, I just want you to ensure that you're paying attention to who's involved in that hiring process And do you have the team involved? Do you have your managers involved? Do you have a skip level manager involved? The reason being is if HR is the only person doing the hiring, guess what? They're an easy target to blame. And if the hiring manager is the only person hiring, many times we miss some of the compliance items that are so desperately needed to ensure that, hey, we're making a right hire. We're not asking any illegal questions. So we want to make sure that we have all of the individuals involved and those individuals are trained well in that specific hiring process. And then the last thing that I really want to focus on is the impact of COVID. So, you know, we know that we've had a hybrid workforce for about the last year. Remote employees are going to become more normalized and hiring processes do need to combine that virtual and in-person process to ensure that, hey, we've got some cost savings, we've got time savings. And that's something that, you know, Sherm has stated from a LinkedIn survey is that 70% of organizations are specifically using a hybrid approach for hiring. So, you know, are you now doing all Zoom interviews instead of phone interviews for that very first conversation with an individual? It's a key question. Are you only doing Zoom interviews? And can you get everything that you need out of those Zoom interviews to really be successful? When we had a conversation with our our clients, so every Monday we bring our clients together for either a webinar or kind of an office hours. And our conversation last Monday was all about, hey, what does this look like for hiring? And what are you specifically doing? And what just about every one of our clients stated is, listen, we're actually using Zoom interviews for that first interview because it's time-saving instead of doing the phone interview because we can see the individual, we can interact with them, we can see their facial expressions, we can see if they're a mess because of what they're wearing, right? There's all those things that we can see in that initial interview. And that Zoom gives us the ability to do that at a very low cost and very time-saving. So just wanted to keep that in mind for you as you're looking at, hey, what specifically changes from from moving from, you know, before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID? So with that being said, as we wrap up this episode, you know, we always have one key takeaway for executives and one key takeaway for HR listeners. And, you know, that key takeaway for our executives today is to ensure that you have insight into the hiring process and that you really lead by example with your executive team. So when you're leading by example with your executive team, you're essentially stating to that team, we need to be involved in in the hiring process because at the end of the day, we're going to be ultimately responsible for how these individuals do. Let's just look at cost for a second. If we hire someone into our organization that becomes a liability, that's cost. Not only is it a time suck in our organization, but there's dollars associated with that. So we want to ensure that we're involved in those key pieces as much as we need to be, but not 
too much either. And so one actionable piece that I would, you know, suggest is do skip level interviews. So have that skip level manager, not the immediate manager, but one level up, interview the candidates once HR vets them for you. Interview those candidates and only pass along, you know, two or three to the hiring manager because you want the hiring manager to make that hiring decision because that ensures that the hiring manager and the employee are building that relationship on day one. Remember, the manager manages the employee, not HR. And yet, we do need to make sure from that skip level or executive level that that hiring manager is not hiring based on that gut need of, oh my gosh, I need somebody yesterday, because that would entice them to potentially make a poor hiring decision. So we want to set all of our managers up for success. All right, our second actionable takeaway is for our HR folks. And what you know our suggestion is to is to have a standard operating procedure in place there are times where you're going to get a call from a manager that says hey tracy i need somebody yesterday i need you to pull somebody in immediately who can you bring in so if you have a standard operating procedure in place and you have a pool of candidates that you've been cultivating relationships with over time whether that is through social media, whether that's through conversations and job fairs versus the post and pray method, right? Then you have that that pool of candidates that you can pull from, especially for those line level employees that you may need like that. So those are two actionable takeaways for you. And if you want more, we are doing, we've done two webinars the month of February specifically on hiring, and those are recorded in, in our Talent Optimization Foundation program, and you can find those there. A link to that is in our show notes. So if you want those actionable steps to go a bit deeper than what we talked about today, be sure to join us on our Talent Optimization Foundation program. Thanks so much for joining us today and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Talent Optimization Podcast. You'll find more tools and resources for CEOs and HR professionals looking to bridge the strategies versus implementation gap of talent optimization at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. We've also created a free, valuable resource for you to begin bridging the gap called the Talent Optimization Foundation Membership Program. You can access it for free at elevatedtalentconsulting.com forward slash foundation. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode to learn more about talent optimization and creating a dream team for your organization.